Good afternoon, and welcome to today's program titled Understanding the Art of AMA Blocking in Behavioral Health. I'm Tom Valentino, Senior Editor of Addiction Professional. Today's program is sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network and Scorpion. Thank you to our sponsors and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we have a few details we'd like to go over. To submit a question or a technical issue, please use the Q&A area below the slides at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program. To download a copy of the presentation, please click the link in the Resources tab to the right of your slides. A special note about CE credit. To get your CE, you must watch the program all the way through the Q&A section at the end of the presentation. At the end, do not leave the web page. The site will automatically redirect you to a survey, and this survey must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those watching in a group, please download the group submission guide in the resources tab and follow the instructions provided. Please note, CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event. Finally, for those of you who tweet, please tweet along with us using our hashtag today, APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Todd Stumbo has over a decade of experience in the field of addiction and is currently the Chief Executive Officer at Blue Ridge Mountain Recovery Center, a short-term intensive residential facility in Ball Ground, Georgia that treats males and females ages 18 and up. Thank you, Todd, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you, Tom, and uh, thank everybody that's joining today. Um, the art of AMA blocking, it, it became very personal to me uh, when I started at Blue Ridge. Um, I started, my boss kind of challenged me to look at some of the stuff we were doing. Um, one of my, it was about my third month that they turned me loose with the program. I was the clinical director at the time. And we had around 13, uh, a mix of AMAs and, and administrative discharges, and, and I cleaned the program up. But one thing he said to me, he came to me and said, Todd, you know, great job cleaning the program up. Don't ever let that happen again. So I began this relentless search on what are AMAs, why do they happen, because it, it was a phenomenon to me. I, nobody understood. Nobody could tell me exactly what was going on. So I want to start this by, by telling you guys a story, um, and recently I've actually found out it may not even be true, but I love the story. So it's about eagles, uh, and some of you all may have seen this or, or heard about it, but the eagle, they say, it can live up to 70 years, but something occurs around year 40 um, where that eagle has to make a choice to go through something very painful, an extreme amount of change, or it has to die. Um, so at year 40, what happens is its beak begins to curl over where it can't eat food anymore, its talons do the same thing, where it can't grab anything, and its feathers get really thick on its chest, and it causes it to have a hard time to fly. So around year 40, that eagle has to make a decision um, to fly up on a mountaintop somewhere and kind of nest, uh, and for several months, this eagle goes through a transformation. First, it takes its beak and starts to bang it on something hard uh, until it breaks it off. Uh, and as that beak starts growing back, it does the same thing with its talons. Uh, after it gets the, the beak and the talons back, it will start to rip its own feathers out so it grows new ones. And only then can it make that majestic flight again and live another 30 years. So. I tell that story because what I had to, to realize when it came to AMA blocking was a, an extreme change had to take place for myself and the staff that I worked with. Um, so as we go through that, know that piece, uh, I, I hit hard on it towards the end of this, this lecture. Um, but what an AMA is, if it, for those of you that may not know the term, uh, it can be called an ACA or SA. So an AMA means uh, that a, a client leaves against medical advice. Uh, when it's referred to as ACA, it's obviously against clinical advice, and then an ASA would be against staff advice. So 
this is when that client's choosing to leave treatment um, against our advice. So why do they leave treatment? We're going to look at some of the reasons why that takes place. So first off, there's a disorganization within the system possibly. Um, it, this creates anxiety. It can get, generate excuses for that client, reasons why that they should leave. Um, so that's the first thing we have to look at is know that when we are disorganized, it can start to push clients out the door early on. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is the clinician doesn't fully engage the family in the process. Uh, so that's a vital piece because when the, the clients can split the staff and split, um, you know, the referral source and the family, that becomes a pretty big problem. So we always want to make sure we engage significant others, the family member, that kind of thing. The next thing we're going to look at is the lack of attention and orientation to the program. Um, it's a very important piece that we have to address early on because ultimately if people don't feel like they're accepted or they're a part of and they understand the system, uh, they aren't going to want to be in it. So it's that, that front end, that, that welcome to treatment that's vital and important. Um, and I speak a lot of this in terms of residential treatment, but you can put this into play and whether it's inpatient or uh, IOP, PHP, or even private practice, a lot of these things can go into play in all those settings. So you want to make sure you're showing, showing that client a lot of attention on the front end. Um, you're really giving them from the time they walk through the door till the time you're done with that admission process, your full attention and it's not distracted, it's not handing them off to multiple people, that kind of thing. And then a very thorough orientation and when you do the orientation, what I like to do is use a senior staff member who's very, very uh, knowledgeable of our program. That way they can make sure they can answer any questions. Um, they're not given a whole lot of I don't knows and whatnot. Uh, the next thing that we look at that can, can drive people out of treatment is poor communication. That's between the staff, the family, the referral source. So a, a big piece on the front end to combat this is always ask for a, an impact letter, if you will, from the family or significant other, or even the referral source. So give us some information about this person. Uh, always engage in the referral source and family when something new comes up. Uh, communicating with each other, the evening staff, the weekend staff, that kind of thing. The next thing we'll look at uh, is poor treatment planning because this does happen. Uh, we get busy, um, that kind of thing, and, and we don't always focus crucially on that individual and do uh, really strong treatment planning. So that piece we're going to talk about in more depth a little later on. One of my favorites is nobody tells the client no. So it, it may sound kind of strange, but I've actually used this technique several times with clients who have came back in our program, I had rapport with them, they start to spin a little bit and they come up and say, hey, you know, I'm th I think I want to leave. And, and I would flat out look at them and say, you know, John Doe, no, you're not, you're not going to leave. And I, I simply walk away. What they end up doing is realizing, okay, they're not going to buy in or feed into to this process again, so I'm just going to have to sit still. I've got to get through this. So it, it can be a skill now. You have to be very cautious when you use that. Uh, obviously, a new client with no rapport built probably won't work too well with them. The next thing is the emotional turmoil left untreated. So guilt, shame, remorse, that kind of stuff, we have to address it on the front end pretty quick. Negative influence from peers is, is, is vital. So whether that's outside influence or inside, so you got to look at uh, what kind of groups do I have in the milieu or in the community that I'm serving? Um, are they detrimental to, to my particular client? What kind of uh, phone time do they get? Are they communicating with outside peer groups? Talking about that stuff in the groups uh, that you have, the intimate settings, talking about it in one-on-one -on -one sessions, because peer influence, especially with the younger population, can be uh, very intense and very hard to combat. The last one, uh, is to fix things on the outside. Now, we've all heard this before. 
uh, I need to go to try to fix my marriage. I need to go to, to fix things at work, et cetera, et cetera. So know that that stuff's going to come up, and those are some of the reasons, as we've done our research, that people either give us or we've seen consistently over and over of why people leave treatment. So now that we kind of know um, some of the reasons, let's look at the, the truths of the matter. Um, some of the truths really are this. People rarely leave treatment early. Oh, sorry. Let me move back a slide. So people rarely leave treatment early because of what we are doing. More importantly, they, they most often will leave treatment because of what we're not doing. So all, we have to look at that piece. And one thing my boss taught me early on was, I have to get out of the method of always blaming the client for leaving. Well, they just didn't want it or this, that, and the other. I had to look at me and, and the staff I work with, what could we do different? Most people, they come into treatment not needing, not thinking that they need the full stay. Um, so some will come in saying, I'm just going to detox, uh, and then I'm going to leave, so on, so on. So um, that's another truth of it. A lot of clients don't know how to ask for what they need. So they will never come to you and ask for what they need, and, and they'll just let it build and build and build until they take off out of treatment. So it's our job to know through looking at assessments, uh, working with the family and the referral source, what do they need, what kind of stuff's going on in their life, and how can I help them out. Um, most people flat out, they do not want to be in treatment. They could find a better place to be uh, in, in their imagination or in their world. Um, one thing I also believe that's the truth is there are no bottoms. There's just more consequences. Because if we tell people that they have a bottom, then their expectation is they'll hit that bottom and want to want to change or want to get help. Well, the problem now is that bottom is killing a lot of people. The flat-out fact is alcohol and drugs will kill them. Um, another truth is that left untreated, these people are incapable of making rational decisions. So that's where we have to really focus on in the first couple of weeks they're with us, say, in residential treatment, is they are oftentimes still heavily irrational and think irrationally. So we have to help them see that, point that out. Um, another truth, help should show up regardless of the way they behave. So we should always be there. They're the sick one. No matter what they do, how they behave, we should always show up to help. Even if it's a, at the point where we got to discharge somebody out of a program, we should help them find something else. We are and have to be the place that offers help, hope, and healing. So we have to have that mentality as we go in. And, and flat out at the end of it, the truth is what an AMA is truly a missed opportunity. And staff typically tries to intervene when a client is about 90% out the door, and at this point, it's often too late. And when you convert them back into stand, it's oftentimes a miracle. So staff has to intervene before an intervention is necessary. I know that sounds kind of weird, but we're going to kind of walk through that process. What does it look like? And that's that prevention piece is we intervene now before it even happens, and we won't have to use some of the interventions later on. Because here's the thing about AMA blocking is, you have to look at it, what's your attitude about it? Because the meaning of things lies not in the things themselves, but in our attitude towards those things. And the question I have is that I ask all the time of my staff and, and people that I train on this is, do you believe that it's life and death? When I sit with a client who has said, hey, I want to leave treatment, do I believe this conversation is one of life and death? Uh, because the reality of it is, they will walk out of that facility and possibly use and die. So I have to go in with a very strong mentality that this could be a life or death situation. So some of the objectives we're going to look at here is, one, we're going to learn how to identify what an AMA really is. Two, we want to learn how to take action and intervene. And finally, we want to learn to create a culture of amazingness at your facility or your program which prevents AMAs. Now, you see those objectives. The first thing we have to do, though, is identify 
what clients are at risk? Who who are we watching for when it when we talk about AMAs and, and the risk? So we're gonna kinda go through those. So here's the people at risk. Young, old, middle aged, men, women, wealthy, poor, alcoholics, addicts, all races, all faiths, all of your clients are at risk. So know that when you walk in it. Now you can determine who's at high risk versus medium risk, low risk, and all, a lot of that will start with the early identification. So the first thing we look at is a crisis call. How do they detail their history on a call inquiry? When they first call in, are they building it all up or are they very humble about it, kind of sound beat down, that kind of thing. So even on our call inquiry, we ask, have you been in treatment before? Have you left AMA? We want to find out on the front end what we're dealing with. Uh, the second thing is when they move to intake, so we've we've taken the call inquiry and we're going to move them over to the intake. Uh, when they start listening to them, what's the reason for treatment? Are they dictating on the front end? Do we have a guy saying, well, hey, while I'm there, I'm going to need to use my laptop daily, that kind of stuff. So you've got to be able to red flag that, watch out for it. Um, the third thing when we're looking at identification is during the assessment. So this is the pre-admission assessment, not our comprehensive, but let's say we're doing a pre-admission to determine what level of care they'll need. What are they telling you? Are, are they talking in terms of, of being a victim? Are they resentful? Uh, do you think they're telling you just what you want to hear? That kind of stuff. So you'll look at that, and, and within that the assessment, we can identify a few more things um, that, that we want to be aware of. So... Clients who report little to no problems, um, they, they kind of minimize things. Clients who have co-occurring disorders, clients who report that they isolate a lot, uh, clients who are externally motivated, and clients with significant cultural differences. Those are all things that you have to be cautious of and try to flag on your assessments. Some more stuff that you want to identify. What we found through some of the research that we've done um, is that Alcoholics and opiate users are the highest risk to AMA in the first 10 to 16 days. Now, the reason being is because oftentimes, say the alcoholic, let's take that one for example, they're usually at a 10-day period, they're, they're ready to go. They have detoxed, they start physically feeling better, though their detox can be one of the most dangerous and life-threatening, they typically start to feel better quicker than anybody else. Um, and then they look up and they see... All these opiate users, these the, the the meth users, cocaine users, and they're like, "Well, I'm not nothing. I'm nothing like these people. Um, I need to go ahead and go. I'm feeling great. That kind of deal." Uh, so that's what happens with the alcoholics. The opiate users, they'll typically be on a, um, a suboxone taper or something like that for the first week. Uh, by the second week, all of that suboxone or detox meds coming out of their system, they start to feel feelings. They hate it they get the running shoes on. Um, so know those things. We also have to look at the cocaine and meth users. Um, they're usually the highest risk in the first 21 days. Um, they have a hard time with getting up, going to group. They get easily frustrated. All those things that you see with, with a lot of depression, stuff like that with stimulant users. So be aware of that. Also, the, another one you have to watch out for, Really, anybody that's on detox meds of any kind, um, oftentimes you'll get people that come in to say they're a residential program that already been detoxed, so they're not as high risk. So if you have to put somebody on detox meds, you want to know those protocols, when they start, when they end, that kind of thing. Anybody with prior um, AMAs you want to be aware of. Um, those people can be high risk as well. That's why we ask on the front end, um, if they'd ever left treatment AMA. And the last one, surprisingly, and I'm going to give you a statistic here in a little bit, but any people that are entering treatment for the first time, they are a high-risk AMA, so just keep that in mind, too, and I'm going to go into detail about that here in just a second. So some of the stats that, that we've came up with here at Blue Ridge is we've done an intensive research over the last three or four years on AMAs, 
and I, and I have a three-hour presentation where I talk about that, what we tracked, how we tracked it, all that. But some of the stats that came out, because a lot of people think you're the, the most prevalent and the highest risk is your opiate users. Well, what we found was male alcoholics who, who report their only drug of choice to be alcohol have a 17% AMA rate. Um, female clients who only uh, report only their DOC to be alcohol have a 14.6% AMA rate. Now, males 30-plus, they have a 16% AMA rate. So if you took a 30-plus-year-old male that only drank alcohol, you've got a very high-risk client right there for an AMA. Same thing with females 30 to 39. It was dramatically significant. It, it, they were 28% AMA rate. So you've got a female 30 to 39 who only drinks alcohol. It is going to be hard to hang on to that person. Uh, and we look at why that is, and a lot of times what we've kind of nailed down is that we get a lot of excuses. But the guilt and shame, especially when they have kids, and I'm going to go into detail about that, um, is pretty significant, and they have a hard time managing and coping with that. Um, another cool stat that we found was days of the week uh, for admission. So people that admit on a Friday, they typically have a 17% chance of leaving AMA. Um, and, and the reason being is what we found was over the weekend, if the program's more relaxed, not as much structure, no clinicians, it can be a problem. So you want to strengthen that weekend up. Monday admits, 16% AMA rate. That's often because by, let's say, with, with alcoholics, they're on a three-day detox. By Friday, they're, they're feeling much better. They're good to go. They take off over the weekend. So those are some things to keep aware of, um, and, and I, I've got a lot more stats if anybody's ever interested in those. But here is what we found. The people that are 30 to 39 years old have the highest AMA rate. 17.89%. Um, so realize that even the younger population, though we had more clients, uh, the percentage was significantly lower when it came to AMA rates. Some other findings when we go into more detail of that person. So 20% of married males ages 30 to 49 with kids left AMA. Um, so that's a pretty big stat for us. We watch it and monitor it. Um, the females was even higher. That was a 29%. Um, and then here's the one I spoke about earlier. 23% of the clients that discharged uh, from Blue Ridge, if you take females and males combined, 23% between 2015 and 16 that left AMA, they were married in between the ages of 30 and 49 and had kids. So that is a huge population that we have to keep our eyes on when it comes to AMAs. So here's the uh, other slide that earlier I mentioned about the people that attended treatment for their first time. So 51% of the clients that discharge AMA either had only attended detox or never attended treatment. And why does this happen? You know, and, and, and it's gotten more significant, and I don't have the actual facts yet of what we think. I speculate, though, this is insurance companies have made it much more easy for people to learn this system. And I know of clients who live in sober livings and IOPs and, and stuff like that off of their insurance, so they'll stay in treatment much, much longer. The new person that comes in that's never been to treatment before, they're seeing a lot sicker clients that, that we deal with, whether they're, they're using spice or all these designer drugs, um, having mental health issues, all that, and they come in and it, it spooks them and they take off. Um, that's just my own opinion and my speculation uh, of what's kind of happened. We're going to continually track and monitor this to see what it does reveal. Um, so let's look at some of the interventions uh, and prevention techniques that we can utilize. So the first one, do you want to understand what the client's job is? Um, oftentimes we have an expectation of these, these clients that is way too high. Um, I've seen it in programs where you come in, your orientation is all about laying out rules. Um, well, these people have a hard time following rules, and when they get out of line, 
we tend to want to, to scold them, discipline, ask them to leave, whatever the case may be. Their job and all they know how to do is not follow direction. Um, that, that's just a simple fact. So we have to understand that and understand that's what they will do. Um, the next thing, you want to communicate everything, all the information that's gathered with all the staff that could help with AMA blocking. Uh, this has to begin before the admission even arrives and throughout the treatment process. One of my best AMA blockers, well, I'll say two, uh, is the housekeeper that we have and a person in dietary because they hear a lot of what the clients say and they really get to know them on a different level. Um, so we train them in what to do, how to do it, the AMA blocking procedures, how to communicate and what to communicate to the clinical staff and so on. So it's very important that you learn how to communicate with all staff. The third one, learn to communicate with families and significant others um, and, and oftentimes discuss the things to expect. So one of the things that we've utilized is a family packet and a referral source packet where we can give them, hey, expect the possibility of your loved one or your referral wanting to leave treatment. Here's some of the signs of that. Here's what you can do to help us combat that. Um, communicate with the referral source. We kind of went through that one. Some of the next ones, you want to work to have the same staff member complete the entire mission process if possible. Um, again, I don't know everybody's process, but for us, so it's a lengthy, you know, got some paperwork, takes about an hour, hour and a half. I want this one person to build strong rapport as possible with this client because if they begin to spin in three or four days, I will call on that staff member to come back and sit with that person to see if they can help reel them back in, keep them in treatment, um, that kind of thing. Next, obtain uh, consents to release information from everybody. You want to do this upon admission. Uh, if That is probably one of the most significant times because clients often come in in, in a, some form of surrender where they're like, okay, I'm getting help, I'm going to do this. If you wait too long and they start to build that control back, they will not give you consent. They'll start getting paranoid, questioning it, that kind of thing. So it's most effective to get it on the front end. Uh, and oftentimes if a family is there or during the admission process, I always try to do it with the family present as well. Um, the, then the next thing, review your AMA handout. And, and I talked about this a little bit earlier is communicating that stuff, going over it with the family. Then having a, the assigned counselor follow up within 72 hours, introduce themselves, and go over that information again. So the next things we want to look at is the counselor assignment. It must make sense. So if I've got a 24-year-old heroin addict and uh, he struggles with authority and I put him with a clinician, let's say that's, 58 that's old school and does it the old school way, that's probably not going to gel too well. So we got to be aware of that. You want to get your entire team involved in the process, um, you know, as well. And that initial admission process and orientation, the welcome to treatment, you got to be polite, have energy, that kind of stuff. So moving on. The next thing we want to look at is weekend counselor and shift leader. You want to have somebody that's strong that can meet with these clients when they admit on the weekend. You want to have an accountability buddy who is a senior staff that may be in their group or their age range that you can partner with them to kind of show them around, uh, that kind of stuff. Their bed assignment or room assignment has to make sense. Uh, so you can't put a, a young person that struggles to sleep with an older guy who snores like crazy, it will drive that young guy out of, out of treatment. So you have to be aware of those things. Get that information on the front end if somebody has an issue with snoring, trouble sleeping, that kind of thing. Be available and organized. So you always want to, to have your clients feel like you're available to meet with them or your staff's available to meet with them, and we're very organized in, in how we deal with things and what we do. The next thing, you want to have a safe, secure place to, to meet clients. Um, you don't want it to be out in the open where everybody can see. 
sometimes that's good, especially in the springtime when it's nice and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think it may have skipped the slide here. Let me go back. We'll move on from there. Uh, you want to create an environment of structure and fun as well. Have some games they can do. Make sure you listen to the clients. Don't be typing or doing something else. You really want to pay attention to them um, and repeat what you hear with true empathy. Uh, remain focused and don't tell your story. You, this is when you want to utilize clinical skill uh, and the client's input to develop some solutions on how to get them to stay. Be fearless and honest with the person. Tell them what you truly think um, as, a, as a clinician and what, what could happen to them if they walk out of treatment. Uh, always plan for that problem before it shows up. So you're always AMA blocking before the client even comes in. So the last few things we got on the, these slides is you, you ask what they need to support in treatment. Um, you also want to negotiate an agreement that supports their needs, whatever that may look like. And if an impasse occurs, you want to initiate contact with a support system of some sort, um, whether it's a referral source, the family, that kind of thing. Um, use your guidelines group where you can, can talk about the, the guidelines of the program, that kind of thing. The older population loves that because um, the younger population struggles with it. Have a 72-hour process. So we ask clients typically, hey, we're asking you to stay for 72 hours and complete these things. And we hand them a sheet that I'm, I'm more than welcome to share with everybody. Just let me know, and I can email it to you. But we hand them a sheet and a process of what they need to go through before they discharge AMA. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's found to be highly effective in slowing them down, keeping them in treatment, uh, you know, when they can think about it for a minute they'll kind of slow themselves down and, and change their mind. So one thing I want to hone in on is the treatment planning piece of it, the importance of it. Um, the first thing is you want to collaborate with the client, uh, use their perspective with the counselor's input. It's a, a huge piece. Then you want to decide the client's stage of change related to the problems it's presenting because if you're ahead of them, they will struggle to work your treatment plan. So you've got to make sure you know where they are at in the change process. Next thing, engage the client around the development of the treatment plan. And I like to redefine it as called a change plan. This is just my personal um, kind of preference is when I hear the word change plan versus treatment plan, it, it just it, it excites me a little bit more. I'm more interested. Uh, a lot of the clients I've worked with, I've used it as called it a change plan. Hey, we're going to help you change, and here's the plan that we're going to utilize. Um, you want to start that change plan um, with how the treatment services available are going to help that client accomplish their goals. So it's important to kind of go over with them. This treatment plan will help you in this way and show them exactly how that will, will happen and how that will work. Uh, you want to highlight and reinforce the client's strengths um, and show them, because a lot of times we continually point out the weaknesses um, and we don't really show them what they need to be doing as far as strengths go. And I'm having a small issue with my slides here. Let me, uh, give me just a second. I'm having an issue advancing the slides. So I'm going to kind of keep talking while they're, they're working on that um, for a second. Um, you want to, to make sure that you generate a treatment plan review each week. Um, what it does for the clients helps them keep moving forward uh, and it keeps you as a staff member organized and it shows this progression towards the discharge planning. So that's very important to do is always have that 
uh, treatment plan review going on, uh, whatnot, to help that client continue to feel like they're moving forward because there's nothing worse than feeling stuck. Um, you want to avoid the trap of getting ahead in the client in the change process. So if you want to move faster than a client is changing, you will lose that client time and time again. You'll lose rapport, so on, so on, and, and you'll never be able to help them advance through the program. Um, you want to involve significant others. Make sure you contact family members, referral sources, whatever you, wh whoever's involved, and let them know what's going on, the treatment plan that you're going to put in place, see if they've got any kind of feedback um, or whatnot as you go through it. You want to monitor successful com completion of goals and movement towards um, everything that they're doing, the values that they have, the change in lifestyle choices, all that kind of stuff. So it's important that you monitor that, applaud that. I know some programs that have little rewards that you may get as you complete different treatment plans or, or get things done with your, um, your clinician. So you can do that. I know programs that use bracelets, um, different rings, coins, things like that. So that can be a cool thing to utilize. Make treatment exciting. Um, and here's the thing. Who would want to spend, however long your, your treatment program is, who would want to spend 35 days like us in a dull environment where it wasn't exciting? Um, so now that we've kind of looked at some of these different interventions that we can do and treatment planning in detail, some of the recommendations I'm going to kind of throw out there, we've looked at, and, and we're just going to kind of review real quick. Then I'm going to start to wrap this up and really point out the one most important thing, I think, um, the skill or the thing about us we need to know when it comes to AMA blocking. So on the recommendations, you really want to let the client know what they're going to be feeling as they go through this process. Um, you can tell that client that during the admission. We actually have it in the, the client handbook. It tells them the types of feelings they'll go through whatnot, um, and then reference back to it when they start to put on their, their running shoes and say, hey, you remember we talked about this, you're going to feel it, you can get to the other side. Utilize any kind of morning staff meetings you have. Um, you want to pay attention to the detox protocols, what they're on, uh, when it ends, all those kind of things. Get collateral from the uh, info from your referral sources and families. We discussed that a little bit earlier. We talked about intervening early. Um, not waiting until the client comes up and says, hey, I want to leave treatment. Um, some other recommendations. Re review your admissions process, uh, the length of time it takes, how many people were involved, you know, how many people got their hands in the cookie jar, so to speak. Because um, here's what I know is like for us, I even think an hour is a long time, but I know some programs that it may take seven or eight uh, that just would run me out of treatment personally. So you want to look at it, how can we streamline it, make it comfortable uh, for that client and the family that's coming in. Strong, secure clinical staff on the weekends. You want to make sure you have that. Update any kind of older furniture, damaged furniture within the facility. A lot of people will try to save money. Um, but here's two things, updating that furniture and painting your facility are two things you don't want to waste, uh, you know, your time on not doing. The reality of it is we judge things within the first 15 seconds as we see them. So you want things to look nice, be nice. Um, and on, on my other three-hour lecture, I go into the paint colors, what kind of emotions they drive. That can be a very important thing that we look at, and I can send that out as well if people want it. Um, the last thing is you want to communicate. Make sure you're communicating everything you can with other people. So here's the thing. What, what do we believe all this creates? Um, for me, I believe it's the most important thing. It, it's truly creating this culture for AMA identification. That's the key to prevention. So, so what is a culture? To me, it's a way of believing, behaving, thinking, and working that exists amongst people. Um, what's the current culture at your work? Does it need to change? You have to start to ask yourself that. Here's what I define it as. An amazing culture is when people are striving to be everything 
anybody could ask for. Now, is that a tall, irrational order? Absolutely, and that's why it will be so powerful. If we strive to do that, we will impact other human beings in such an amazing way that it will change their lives forever. You create an amazing cu culture by choice. Uh, you always have to do more than expected. We're only going to fail when we do everything everyone else is doing. You have to come up with different angles, different techniques. Uh, we must do different and we must be different because, again, this is a life or death situation. So to be different and have this amazing culture for AMA prevention, we, we have to know our driving force. What exactly is that? What does it mean? Um, so I'm going to kind of go into that. Our driving force, ultimately, here it is. I define it. The driving force behind a healthy culture is customer satisfaction, and the driving force behind customer satisfaction is you. So the driving force behind you has to be a genuine desire to amaze those customers you work with. So if you only had one shot to prove yourself, one shot to make a difference, would you go the extra mile? This is this is the reality. Uh, there is one key. What, what's the one key in, in AMA blocking? The most powerful thing to me, ultimately, it's this. It's our attitude. If you get up expecting to have a bad day, you will rarely disappoint yourself. You have to have this irrational belief. When I sit across from this person that wants to leave AMA, I can I will stop them. Now, is that reality? Do you always do that? No, but if I go into it with a mindset, I'm not going to be able to stop this person, guess what? You're not going to be able to stop that person. This, this thing has to drive you. It has to be what wakes you up in the morning is this passion to really get down and dirty when, when people are hurting, struggling the most. Um, and that's the difference in attitudes. Your attitude has to create raving fans, um, and, and this amazing culture will inspire different stories. An amazing culture, it begins with anyone because everybody can make a difference. That's what you have to know, and it, it, it has to come from the heart, from the inside out. You can't mandate people to do this. Uh, all you can do is give them a platform and let it start to come out. Now, does this require change for us? And, and if so, where does that change begin? Um, that's what we have to ask ourselves. So if it starts with you, then, then you got to ask yourself, I did a, an assignment for my CEO when I was a clinical director. He asked me to go to three people and ask them, what is it like to live on the other side of me? That was a hard question because what I got was 21 pages written uh, and I thought it was going to be awesome. I thought they were going to tell me how great I was, all that. Well, out of the 21, I only got 20 back. My, my wife at the time wouldn't even give me one of the pages. Out of the 20, 19 and a quarter were defects. It, it, it crushed me. Um, here's what I learned. I, I worked hard. I worked three different jobs at the time so my wife could sell them with the kids. She, I thought I was a great provider and, and identified all that. What she saw was I was neglectful. So to really sit down and say, what is it like to be on the other side of Todd? What does that feel like? What's that experience for the client? Uh, that's what we have to ask ourselves. So what is it like to be on the other side of you guys uh, when you're sitting down getting clinical work done? I'm going to show you a quick video, and we're going to wrap this up. Come
so I show that video because there's this concept called the power of one. And while many doors open and close for your clients, what I know has to happen, your doors have to transform. You have to understand the power of one. This video speaks about it. I had the power of one in my life. A man named Jason Wyron stepped into my world when I tried to get sober and changed me forever. I was told most of my life that, that you're just one person, you can't do this, you can't do that. I no longer believe that. Here's the reality. At, at 211 degrees, water is it hot. At 212, it begins to boil. When it boils, it makes steam, and that steam can generate a locomotive. One degree makes all the difference in the world. One person makes all the difference in the world. Well, if you don't hear anything else I said today, leave this webinar with that idea of the power of one. It, you know, if one person went out and positively affected 10 people in a year, and those 10 went out and positively affected 10 more in seven years, one million people would be positively affected. So my first call to you today is leave this webinar and find somebody by the end of next month that you can dramatically and powerfully influence and have a positive effect on. It, it will change you. It will change what you stand for. Because um, at the end of, end of your life, how will it be measured? What would your funeral eulogy be? Um, the reality of it is, is you got to ask yourself, do you know your why? Because some of you do, and you, you feel it burning inside of you, but you never de kind of defined it. Your why is what drives you. It, it truly is what inspires you. Your why is what you do every single day that makes a difference in somebody's life. For me, my why is impacting another human being in such an amazing way that it changes them forever. Helen Keller said this, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. To me, I, I can't think of anything worse. Uh, once I got sober and, and the work I do now, I can't imagine my life without the direction, without the passion, without the purpose, without that vision. So you got to decide what you're going to do and take it and run with it. The reality of it is my why is what I do every single day that makes a difference in somebody's life. It literally, for me, my purpose and my why, it's a burden to wake up daily with the thought of how many people will die from this disease. And may my life be a living thank you to everybody on this webinar who knew your why when I got sober because it saved my life and it kept me in treatment. When Jason sat across from me with the passion and the purpose uh, that he had when I wanted to walk out the doors, it saved me. It kept me there. When we leave this world, there are going to be two dates on either side of a dash, and you have to make sure that dash is not empty. Make sure it's full of life, full of living. And Oscar Wilde said this, to live is one of the rarest things in the world. Most people exist, and that is all. Please don't leave here today living like everybody else and simply existing. Be amazing when you sit across from that client that wants to leave treatment. Don't just rely on clinical skill. Dig deep for, really, why are you sitting there? Why are you sitting across from that perfect person? You find your why. You find your purpose. It's the one thing that when you do it, time completely stops. It's that burning that's so deep in your soul. It's what makes life worth living. It truly is what lights you up. So first, if you change your attitude, you know your why, you will rise above the crowd, and you will keep people in treatment. Their lives count on it. So just know your why. If you walk away here, go find your why. Thank you, guys. I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. All right. Thank you, Todd. That was a very informative presentation, and um, we've already had a number of questions coming in from our audience. However, we would like to remind you that you can use the Q&A area below the slides to submit a question at any time here over our final few minutes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go into the questions here. You know, one of the, uh, the terms you had used earlier on, um, accountability buddy. Um, can you explain a little bit more um, about the role of the accountability buddy? Yeah, absolutely. So that accountability buddy, what they do is they're, say, a, a senior client for us, 
they're going to be on, on about week three of their treatment. They have to be doing well. They're working their treatment plans. Um, they know the system, know how it works. So their role is to really partner up with the newcomer, start to show them around, be there for support, tell them their experience when they were in, in the detox, when they moved here, when they did this, did that, their experience with the treatment planning, um, and walk them through that process. So the accountability buddy is kind of like a big brother. Um, they help hold that person accountable, um, and they let them know up front a lot of times, and not per our instruction, the accountability buddy will be the one that comes and tells us, hey, uh, John Doe, is, is think, he told me he's thinking about leaving treatment. So that's kind of their role and in, in what they do for the new newcomer. Okay. Um, one of the things you had mentioned um, in your recommendations was uh, in terms of uh, facility and, and just, you know, kind of taking care of, of the of the space there and keeping things up to date. Um, do you have? I know you said you have a whole separate presentation on that, but do you have any quick uh, tips and and low cost options and things that uh, folks listening today should prioritize? Yeah, if you look at let's just say paint in your facility. Uh, you don't have to have a painter come in or professionals. I mean, you can get staff like uh, we do staff work days where we'll paint, we'll do lawn care, whatever the case may be. But colors that are, are less saturated and relatively bright, bright like sage green, they're typically going to be more relaxing. While things that are, are heavily saturated, not very bright like a, a sapphire blue may create energy. So you have to be careful about where you paint certain things in the facility uh, and like I said I've got a whole breakdown of what like the color green it, it evokes this feeling of restoration quieting emotional res quieting and emotional responses things that, like that while red is very happy and stimulating um, pink the interesting thing about pink is it's often associated with romance Here's the problem with it. A lot of the girls that, that associate pink with their childhood, so if you have a female that has experienced sexual abuse as a child, it can provoke trauma in them because they go back to that. So there's different things you want to look at. Brown, it can, it can create this cozy, snug feeling, um, of those kind of things. Okay. Um, if you get into a situation where... Um patients, you know, despite your best efforts, they've made up their mind, they're leaving. Um, what, what can you do in that situation? Is, is there anything, um, any guidance you can give us there? Yeah, so for, for me, it depends on their case. Let's say the person is on detox medications um, and they had a history, uh, well, for us, even if they're just on detox medications, I will give them referrals. If I still have consents in place, I'll contact family and just let them know the final decision that's been made. I'll also let the client know I have to contact the authorities because I'm concerned that you're at risk, you're on our detox protocol, they may come and do a safety check on you. I've had just that knowledge that we're going to do that deter a client from leaving because they don't want to mess with the police. Um, but the biggest thing is I always offer the, the referral source three or four different options for that client if they get in trouble, and I always give them one of our cards and say, listen, if you get in a bind or you need help, even if we can't take you back, we will work to help you get in a place. So at the end of the day, yes, they can make whatever decision they want, and, and, and you can't. We don't restrain people. We don't hold people down. So all we can do is love on them, try to support them, give them the referrals they may need if they do walk out. Okay. Do you have any ideas for training non-clinical staff, such as techs who are not in recovery, uh, to see the AMA problem in, you know, in terms of life and death? Yeah, what we do, and we actually hold this uh, training for our techs and our housekeeping and dietary. I mean, everybody goes through it a couple times a year. Um, so a lot of the information that I presented here, we just go in more depth about it. Um, I do a lot of hands-on training with, with our techs and walk them through when I have a situation there is an AMA um, that comes up that wants to leave. I try to walk them through the why we're doing it and the how we do it. Um, because once people start to understand why are we making this move and what attitude we need to have when we do it, they start to understand it, buy into it more. 
um, that kind of thing. So I do think a lot of the training I, I showed here and even more detailed, like I said, I've got a three-hour one that we do. It's even more detailed, can be very helpful for non-clinical staff to understand different concepts. All right. Uh, I think we have time for maybe just about one more question here. We're going to sift through and see what we got. Um, can you clarify the difference between uh, forced intervention and compassionate intervention? Well, here, here's my thing. I, I'm not sure, like, what that – the whoever asked the question, what they consider a forced intervention. Um, I don't personally believe in any kind of – forced intervention. I believe when people uphold boundaries, let's give example my family, um, their stance was this, and people can call it forced. I don't see it this way. They said, Todd, look, we are no longer going to fund your death, um, but what we will fund is you getting treatment. So the only thing we will pay for you, we're not giving you a car, a place to live, any money, nothing. We will give you a place to go to treatment, and then I had to make a choice. Um, so I don't know that there is a, I mean, out, outside of the legal system saying you have to go to treatment or you have to go to jail, that's about as forced as I think it gets. Um, I'm not a, a believer of locking people up and not giving them a, an option. I, I also uh, take this as I don't believe that you have to want to be sober to get sober. Um, I didn't want that. Uh, and if, if with that mentality, we are slowly killing people with the idea, well, they got to want to be sober to get it. they got to want this, that kind of thing. I didn't want it for six months, yet I kept showing back up. So I always live on that saying is, you know, you hear you can lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. I get that, but you can lead a man to a well and make him thirsty. So my interventions are more about making that client thirsty for a different life than what they have. All right, uh, we have reached the top of the hour, and uh, I think that's going to be just about all the time that we have for questions uh, for today. Um, we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Uh, please do not leave this page. Please continue to stay on the platform as the site's going to automatically redirect you to a survey, and that survey must be completed in order to generate your CE certificate. For those of you who are watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the group submission guide and the resources tab to the right of the slides and follow the instructions provided. And please note that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for the live event here today on March 28, 2017. I want to thank Todd Stubbo once again for an excellent presentation. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, Foundations Recovery Network and Scorpion, for making today's program possible. And lastly, thank you to those of you in our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another addiction professional webinar. This concludes today's presentation. Have a great